Okay, so we are in Revelation chapter 18 and 17 still. And um, again, we're moving our Revelation to Wednesday nights and our Exodus to Sunday mornings. And so for, on Wednesday nights, we'll be dealing with uh, Revelation here for a little bit. But I wanted to read you something here um, that somebody wrote me on the Internet, uh, on, our, on our YouTube uh, church channel. And um, it, was, it was regarding some uh, Revelation Bible study we did. And if you look at um, Daniel chapter 11 here, we'll see what he's telling me, what he's telling you, and what he's telling the world. The world needs to know this. Daniel chapter 11. Um, this is from some guy named Smith. And he wrote this. He said, I keep warning what the Holy Spirit said to me after I humbled myself, even if it falls on deaf ears. So this fellow here has been warning people. Uh, the Holy Spirit said something to him after he humbled himself. Even though it falls on deaf ears, he's going to tell it because the Holy Spirit told him to tell it. Okay? This is not an opinion or interpretation. The Holy Spirit said this himself after I humbled myself, after what happened to my mom and dad. I don't know what that means. Believing as a child, trusting God fully, like a child does a parent, and that small, still voice, the Holy Spirit answered me. And this is what he told me. Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 19. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. The Holy Spirit told him that's Donald Trump. So write that in your Bible. Let's keep on going. Verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate uh, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. The Holy Spirit told him, this is Joe Biden. Verse 21, and his state shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So, according to the Holy Spirit, or this guy tells, says the Holy Spirit told him, verse 19 is Trump, followed by Biden, verse 20, and then in verse 21, and his estate shall stand up a vile person. He said that is Obama. So Obama's going to be president. According to what the Holy Spirit, this man says, told him. Um, look at Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Now he's warning us about this. I don't know what we're supposed to do with it or do about it, but he's warning us. Okay? Look at Revelation chapter 17. And look at uh, verse number 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and was not, or is not, and even he is the eighth, is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So here's what he said the Holy Spirit told him. He told him that uh, there's five fallen, and uh, the next uh, three is Trump is the sixth, Biden is the seventh, Obama will be the eighth. So I guess he's saying Obama's going to be the Antichrist. Um, now, how true is this? Uh, it's speculation. It's somebody's thoughts, even though he thinks the Holy Spirit told him this. But the Holy Spirit, I don't think, tells you things like this. Uh, this guy's probably some kind of charismatic background. He probably is involved with some kind of apostolic, uh, new apostolic, kingdom building thing or whatever and uh, so in any case uh, I thought I'd share that with you uh, do I believe that uh, anything's possible but I wouldn't say the Holy Spirit told me this and this is absolute truth uh, as I said before a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation we're speculating about some of it some we can be sure about some we're speculating about a little bit but the people in the tribulation period they'll know if any of this stuff is what's true and what's not true. They'll have the book of Revelation and they'll be able to figure it out in the tribulation because they'll see things happening. Uh, and, the, and the book of Revelation will be like the newspaper. All you'll be reading the newspaper the day before stuff happens. 
and you'll see it as it happens and stuff like that. So that's an interesting interpretation. Uh, and someone could say that, I suppose, which he did, but uh, you don't go around saying the Holy Spirit told me this, the Holy Spirit told me that, uh, because we don't know that. I don't know who this guy is. Why would he tell this guy that? Of all the people in the world, why would he tell this guy that? I don't know. So if God gives you some revelation that nobody's had for 2,000 years and nobody else has, uh, you might want to keep that to yourself. <laughs> okay, because um, it's not going to probably come to fruition. Um, anyway, the body of Christ is going to go into apostasy before the Lord returns. We understand that, but uh, that doesn't mean that we're all a bunch of idiots at the end of the church age. Uh, it doesn't mean that. So, anyhow, I'm just sharing that with you to see what people are saying out there. Okay, now uh, let's go to Revelation 17 and 18 here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, I'm using uh, Brother Larkin's book here on the book of Revelation. And um, I want to talk about this here, and that is the idea that, now this is what Larkin says. Larkin says, and anybody that is dispensational um, traces their uh, doctrinal beliefs and viewpoints and stuff like that back to Larkin. Uh, you may learn a lot of things in church. You may come pick up. You may pick up on things yourself. Read the Bible, of course you will, and then you'll read somebody's book or hear somebody preach something and say, "Well, I don't think that's right." Or you'll hear them say something and say, "Oh, yeah, I never noticed that, but yeah, that looks like that's true." And you'll see stuff and you'll grow like that. Um, and when it comes right down to it, though, uh, there is some uh, people, some men uh, in the background who have laid out a lot of this stuff, and Mark was one of them. Now, what Larkin says is this. Larkin says that, um, I don't know if I said this the other day or not, but we've been discussing amongst some of us, and that is the idea of, is this really Babylon rebuilt, or is this uh, figurative of some kind? And uh, many people are thinking that both of them are literally Babylon, and some are thinking that they're not. Now, this is what Larkin says. Larkin says that in chapter 17, that is, um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a figure battle. It says it's figured battle. And it's actually a reference to uh, Battenfield 1. And it's actually a reference to um, Rome. And he says in chapter 18, that battle in there is the commercial battle. And it is a literal battle. He believes that the literal battle will be rebuilt. But it's not going to be the one that's chapter 17. Uh, chapter 17, he says, is the religious battle on, which is what I've always thought. And then literal battle will be the commercial battle. That is the economic powerhouse of the tribulation period. So that's what I think is probably going on here, and that is what's happening. And so, just with that there, I'm going to read you some stuff what he has to say about this. And um, we talked, um, I guess it was a week or so ago, about how that um, Christ has a bride. There's a city. It's called New Jerusalem. We read about that in Revelation chapter uh, 21. And um, then uh, he said that Satan being a counterfeit... Um, the Antichrist, uh, rep, uh, being a counterfeit of the Son of God, uh, he'll also have a bride, which is a city, and that city, uh, many people say, would be the city of Rome, which is chapter, in chapter 17. So now going on from that here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this here. Uh, Babel, or Babylon, uh, was built by Nimrod. And again, we're looking at the thing, Babylon is mentioned here in chapter 17 and 18, that's what this, these chapters are about. And chapter 17, verse 5, talks about mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. Uh, and there is, uh, and I've read some stuff here recently about um, the way this is written here. And it's written like this. It's written in your King James Bible like this. Mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. Okay? Now, some versions, from what I 
looked at don't have the comma there. King James Bible does have the comma there. So this is not mystery Babylon. It's mystery Babylon the Great. In other words, it's not, the name is not Mystery Babylon. So this is not Mystery Babylon. He said, I'm going to show you a mystery. And it concerns Babylon the Great. And then he goes into this religious aspect of Rome. But some people that believe that chapter 17 ought to be literally Babylon and not a mystery uh, make a big deal with a comma there. I even looked it up in the Greek. You know what in the Greek? There's a comma there. Just like in the King James Bible. But some of the modern versions don't have that comma in there. So, uh, anyhow, it's mystery. Okay, what's the mystery? Babylon the Great. That's the mystery. Um, now, he says this here. He says, um, we mentioned this other day, that well, sorry, Babel or Babylon was built by Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10. It was the seat of the first great apostasy. Here the Babylonian cult was invented. And uh, we looked at that before, Genesis chapter 10, 8 to 10, talked about Nimrod built Babylon. And then uh, chapter 11 of Genesis, you read there, where God uh, divided the nation, the people up into nations and tongues by confounding their languages, which is what the word Babel means. It means confusion, confusion of tongues. Um, and so the Babylonian cult, and that's what we're talking about here. Look at Revelation 17, 5, mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And he's talking here about false religions, what he's talking about in this chapter. It's a false religion. Uh, and that false religion uh, finds its origin in Babylon. Now, when you look at, um, for instance, you look at um, uh, Genesis chapter f 3. What do you have there in Genesis chapter 3? You have at the end of uh, Adam uh, uh, time in the garden when they were right with God and obedient um, and then they disobeyed God they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of truth of, God, of, truth, of uh, good and evil and then the Lord uh, judges them curses the earth curses them curses the serpent etc and um, then he, he basically expels he expels them from the garden but before he expels them from the garden look what the Lord does here Genesis chapter 3 Genesis chapter 3 Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And look here at um, uh, verse number 21. This is after God has pronounced the curses on Eve that she'll uh, have pain in childbirth and the curse on Adam that he's going to have to dig uh, his food out of the ground and on the serpent that he's going to crawl uh, after this point. Uh, verse 21, And to Adam also, to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Uh, now, that there, you look at that, uh, what he's done is he, they were naked. Well, they didn't know they were naked until they took of that fruit. And then they knew they were naked. The Bible said they were both naked and not ashamed. And then they took of the fruit, their eyes were opened, and they knew they were naked. And so they tried to put clothes on. And what they do? Look at uh, Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse number um, uh, 7. After they eat of the fruit. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And what they did, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they get some fig leaves, and they um, sew them together, and they make aprons for themselves, or coats of some kind here. And um, so they put that on. And when they put that on there, they're trying to cover themselves up because they're naked and they don't want God to see them. They don't want to stand before God naked now because they're, they're ashamed. Uh, they, have a, they have some sense of shame about them here at this point because they've sinned. Uh, when a person sins, they ought to have a sense of shame about it. Uh, look at verse 21 again. So, verse 21, And to Adam also and his wife, did the Lord God make coats? Well, didn't they already make themselves coats, aprons? They've already done that. So God makes them other cups. They made them out of fig leaves. Uh, here God makes them out of skins, skins, and he clothes them. So now what that is, that's a picture of the Lord saying, you know what, uh, you putting on a fig leaf uh, apron here is not going to cover and hide your nakedness or your sin. 
So I'm going to have to cover with something else. Because you've sinned, the principle is in the New Testament that the wages of sin is what? Death, right? And, they, and God told Adam in chapter 2, and uh, look here at verse number um, 17. God told Adam, he said, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he partakes of the fruit. Did he die physically? No. He lived for hundreds of years after that, according to the Bible. He didn't die that day physically, but we believe he did die spiritually. And that's why God put him out of the garden. And so sin enters the world through Adam. And when sin enters the world through Adam, uh, it spreads to every man. It's like an infection. It's a, it's a sinful infection. It's a disease of sin. And it infects everyone that's born with it. Uh, so uh, if you're born with a disease, it's called a here heritable. Is that, is that it? Inher or heritable? What is it? Hereditary. No, I'm sorry. Heritable. That's a new word. Hereditary. It's a hereditary disease. So everybody's born with a hereditary, hereditary disease. Uh, and that's called sin. And so you have the sense of death in you already when you're born. When you're born, there's one thing that's inevitable you can count on. You're going to die. You, when you're born, we don't know if you're going to be rich or poor. We don't know if you're going to be the president or if you're going to be in prison. We don't know both. <laughs> uh, we don't know. Uh, you get that in a minute. Uh, you don't know if... Uh, you know, if you're going to be uh, you know, successful or a failure. But you know one thing for sure, you're going to die one day. We all know that. Why? Because we have this infectious disease called the sin that we inherited from our parents. Uh, Romans 5.12 tells us that uh, uh, sin entered the world through Adam. And death passed upon all men because everybody sinned. All right? So here you have, uh, he's told he's going to die. But he doesn't die physically that day. But no doubt he dies spiritually. And he's, at that point, he's dead in trespasses and sins. Just like when we're born, we're born dead in trespasses and sins. The only difference between us and Adam is this, and that is Adam was made <coughs> sinless. He was innocent. Um, and then he had the opportunity to sin. And then if anybody lost their salvation in the Bible, it was Adam. <laughs> Adam sinned against God, and he got kicked out of the garden, out of fellowship. And uh, the Lord, uh, and he tried, to, he tried to work his way to heaven by the, uh, putting on the fig, fig leaves. Um, and uh, that didn't work. Um, and then God said, you know, that's not good. As a matter of fact, you study, I think it's in Matthew 21 or someplace there where uh, God cursed the fig tree that didn't bear fruit. Um, the Bible says in one place, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So they put on those aprons. That was in essence putting on filthy rags. Uh, to try to cover themselves before God. And God said, that's not good enough. That's not going to work. You're going to die. As a matter of fact, they died the moment they took of that, or took of that fruit. So in Genesis 3.21, after God um, rebukes them, curses them, um, and uh, just before he puts them out of the garden and expels them, uh, verse 21 says he made them coats of skins. So this begs the question, coats of skins. Skins of what? Coats of what kind of skins? Animal skins. Well, what kind of skins would it be? And so what they saw was this. They saw God had to, um, in some way, God may have been there in some physical form uh, as a uh, angel of the Lord or something, but somehow uh, the Lord here spoke to them, uh, spoke to them directly, and then here he uh, literally closed them with the, the coats of skins, animal skins. Um, now, we don't know what kind of animal it was, but we're going to assume from what the rest of the Bible teaches, it probably was a sheep or a lamb that they were clothed with the skin of. An innocent animal that had to die in, in the place of Adam and Eve. So it's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of substitution. Uh, it's a picture of somebody taking the place of the sinner and then the sinner being able to take upon the innocence of that victim that died in their place. Now, up to this point, Adam and Eve have never seen blood. I doubt that they poked themselves or, or cut themselves or slit themselves or anything at this point. Uh, they probably haven't seen blood yet. Uh, but when these coats of skins are made, then uh, some blood's going to have to be shed. So the idea is that God took these animals, uh, 
most likely lambs, and he sacrificed them and um, executed them, if you will, and then he took the coats off of them and clothed them with it. Now that's a picture of salvation. Look at Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. I'm saying this to try to lay out something here about what we're discussing about Babylon here and that false religion. Look at Isaiah 61 and uh, look at verse number 10. Isaiah 61, verse number 10. Uh, he says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. That's a good attitude to have, amen. amen. And why is he greatly rejoicing in the Lord? Why is his soul joyful in his God? Why? For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. So he says there, he says, that God's clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. And what God does when he saves you is he does clothe you with the garments of salvation, and he covers you with the robe of righteousness. So that when God looks at you, he sees you as righteous and as possessing salvation. Now, it's not in and of yourself you have righteousness or have salvation, but because God clothed you with it, he covered you up, just like he did Adam and Eve back then. Um, there's some verses in Psalms that deal with that. I can't think of where right now, but there's uh, one, another one I want you to look at in Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah right before Malachi, almost the last book of the Old Testament. Look at Zechariah chapter 3. You have a new Bible, the pages are probably sticking there. Because you haven't turned to it enough. Yeah. Like mine here hasn't done. Um, Zechariah chapter 3, look at this here. Verse number one. He showed me Joshua. Now this is not Joshua of the book of Joshua. This is not Joshua the assistant to Moses. This is a different Joshua. Uh, he said, I, he showed me Joshua the high priest. Now Joshua is the same name as Jesus in the New Testament. Same thing. Uh, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing in his right hand. To resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and stood before the angel. So here he says in verse number um, one, he said, Here's Joshua, the high priest. He stand before the angel of the Lord. And um, Satan standing at his... Uh, uh, right hand to resist him. So what you have is you have Joshua standing here. He's standing for the angel of the Lord, which would be a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ, and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. So here you have the angel of the Lord. We'll say it's Jesus. Here you have the Satan on one side, and contrary to what the um, Mormons teach, they're not brothers, Jesus and Satan. How many knew that the Mormons believe that Jesus Christ and Satan are brothers? They're not. But that's what they teach. Uh, so here you have Jesus, who, who's the advocate. First John chapter 2 tells us he's our advocate. Uh, he's our mediator. And so he's standing there, and Satan's on the other side. In the middle, there's Joshua. That could be a, that could be, that's a representative of a human being. That's you. You can put your name there. And he says, hey, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this, referring to Joshua, a brand plucked out of the fire? You think about the book of Jude. It's only got one chapter, and then it talks about, you know, some people are, you know, uh, saved uh, so as by fire, like a brand plucked out of the fire. Uh, some people are, are saved because they 
uh, are attracted to the love of God for them. Some people are saved because they are fearful of the judgment of God. And uh, so he says in one place, he says some people are saved by being pulled out of the fire. That is, they're afraid of hell. And here's a guy here who is a brand plucked out of the fire. Here's a soul that was on his way to hell, but now he's been plucked out. He's no longer on his way to hell. Look at verse number 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. What's well, Isaiah 64, 6 says? All our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. Here he says that he's clothed with filthy garments and he stood before the angel, the angel of the Lord. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Think about Adam. He clothed himself, him and Eve, in their own filthy uh, fig leaves, if you will, of self-righteousness. And God took them away and gave them something different that was based on a sacrifice. Um, look what he says here again. Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. What is that change of raiment? We read in Isaiah 61 10. Garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. Um, and he says here, I'm going to change your raiment. Verse 5. And I said, He's going to change the raiment because it's unsatisfactory. It doesn't meet uh, the requirements of God doesn't meet the requirements of God's uh, standard, which is righteousness, because it's filthy garments, it's filthy rags. Um, and so he says, I've caused your iniquity to pass, and I've clothed you, or I'm going to clothe you, with the change of raiment. Verse, set, verse 5, and I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. That's like a little crown. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now, when he says protesting, he's not meaning he's protesting against something. He's protesting in the sense of he's telling you something he needs to know. Protest. Um, what is it? Protest. People talk about protesting against this, protesting against that. But there's also protesting for things. Okay? Look at the word protest. P R O. Pro. That's not negative, that's positive. Pro. Cons and pros. So here he's protesting. Uh, in the, in the uh, Reformation in history, uh, Martin Luther and the Reformers came out uh, protesting uh, the Catholic Church. They took upon the names or, or given the names, designated as what? Protestants. Well, it's a Protestant. He's a Protestant. He's a Protestant. What was he protesting? They were protesting justification by faith. They were protesting salvation by grace. They were protesting... Uh, that uh, Christ is the only mediator. It was a positive thing they were saying. But it came across as negative to those who didn't believe it. So Protestant really was a positive thing. But they're, they're preaching the good news. What's more positive than the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation by grace and justification by faith and eternal security and all these things? I mean, what could be more good news than that? So when you're protesting in that sense, you're, you're saying good things. You're promoting good things, whatever. You're trying to get people to know the truth. Um, so anyway, that's a little side note. That's just a little history there. So when he says he's protesting here, he's uh, basically giving him an admonition. He's encouraging him about something. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and also you shall keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Um, and so anyway, what you see here is this. You see a picture of salvation uh, here with Joshua. You have Jesus on one side, Satan on the other side. Satan wants to condemn you. He's resisting Christ. He's resisting you. And Jesus here is saying, you know, uh, I'm going to change your raiment. I'm going to take the filthy rag of self-righteousness from you. And I'm going to give you the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. That's a picture of God imputing uh, the righteousness of Christ his son to us. And clothing up with his righteousness. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as sinners uh, clothed in filthy rags and self-righteousness. He doesn't see us as sinners naked in our sin. He sees us as sinners who have trusted him clothed with the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. That makes sense. That's what God sees when he sees you. And that's justification. And you can't lose your justification. Justification is your standing before God. God has declared you righteous, and 
um, cause your iniquities to pass and clothe you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so now, when I say that, I say, it to say this. So, people knew this. At least Adam and Eve knew it. Now, look at Genesis chapter 4. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4. Look what happens here. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Adam and Eve um, know each other in the biblical sense. And she conceives and she bears Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. So here's two boys that are born. Possibly twins. Uh, if not, then they're born close to each other. But some people think they're twins. Um, and it says here that uh, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd. Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. One's a, one's a uh, shepherd, one's a farmer. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. The farmer brings some of his fruit and vegetables, stuff he's worked at for the last six to nine months. He brings the best fruit and the best vegetables, probably, to the Lord. Uh, verse 4 Nabal, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. There's the shepherd and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain to his offering he had not respect. Now why did God respect Abel and his sacrifice, but not Cain's? Uh, here's what the teaching is. So what we believe here. Uh, they knew what was required. Why? Because Adam and Eve, their mother and father, must have told them. They said, you know, we were back in fellowship with God back there in the garden. And then God told us, you know, we can have anything and everything we wanted there in the entire store. But just don't eat of that one object there in the garden. Everything else is yours. You can have it. You can touch it. You can enjoy it. Everything. Nothing poisonous. Nothing's going to hurt you. Probably weren't any thorns. As a matter of fact, there were no thorns there. Um, so they were a perfect paradise. Eat. And, um, but then they say, you know what? We messed up. We disobeyed God. And because of that, you know, we tried to cover ourselves up, but then God showed us that we couldn't cover our own sins up and we were still guilty before him. So you know what he did? He took some lambs and he, uh, he uh, basically sacrificed and slaughtered right in front of us. And for the first time in our lives, we saw blood. And blood, when the blood drained out, the life drained out of those lambs. And God took the, that lamb that was innocent and he slayed that or slew that animal that innocent animal and um, he took the skins off of it and clothed us with it and um, that is what God wanted he wanted a sacrifice from an innocent victim which is the lamb that's what the whole Old Testament sacrifice sacrificial system is about it's representing an innocent victim dying in the place of a sinner and that that's going to be fulfilled in the coming of Christ, the Lamb of God, who's crucified and sheds his blood, and then uh, he's the sacrifice for sin, right? So here Adam and Eve, no doubt, told Cain and Abel this. They know what to bring. They said, well, we, we, we put on the fig leaves, you know. Didn't work. God didn't accept that. He only accepted the, the skins of the animals, which is, is the way to sin's death, so somebody has to pay for it, and that animal did in our place. Now look at this again in light of that. What you see here is that Abel, the shepherd, he brings the sheep from the flock. Okay, that would be similar to what God did there in chapter 3, verse 21, when he clothed them with the skins of animals. But what did Cain bring, the farmer? He brought the fruit of the ground, an offering of the Lord, verse 3. And God didn't have respect to it. Why is that? What did God do to the ground? He cursed it. Look at Genesis chapter 3 again. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 17. Unto Adam he said, this is after he sins, and before he is clothed in uh, the animal skins, and before he's expelled. Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. In other words, you're going to have to dig the food out of the ground now. Uh, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth. Before this there were no thorns and uh, no, uh, 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 what do you call those trees? What do you call those trees of pinch? 
stick, sticker trees, I guess, or sticker bushes, sticker bushes, right? Sticker bushes. No thorns, no sticker bushes. Um, thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now you're going to have to really earn your keep by sweating till you return back to the ground. So again, he says here the ground is cursed at this point because of Adam's sin. So when Abel, I'm sorry, Cain, the farmer, comes up with his uh, fruits and vegetables, guess what? He got stuff out of the ground that's been cursed. He's offering God something that's cursed. Well, that lamb is not. He's, he's innocent. But that fruit and vegetable, somebody said that, you know, that was uh, uh, Cain's uh, fruit and vegetable stand. Fruit and vegetable religion kind of thing. And that is, you know, he brought the works of his hands. Literally. That's what he brought. Okay, so God doesn't accept that because it's cursed. He does accept the lamb that he brings, that Cain brings. Um, and so look at verse number 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth. He got mad. He was angry. And his countenance fell. You can see it in his face. This guy was angry, man. He was upset. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you upset? Why are you mad? Why are you angry? And why is that countenance fallen? I can tell by looking at you, something's not right. Your face just fell. What's wrong? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you do the right thing and bring the right sacrifice, everything's going to be cool. And if thou doest not well, if you don't bring the proper sacrifice, then sin lieth at the door. In other words, the problem is sin. You've sinned against me. Uh, if you have brought the right sacrifice, you could do that, but you didn't do it. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He says, uh, sin's desire is going to be towards you, but you need to rule over it. And you can do that if you'll bring the proper sacrifice. If I do as well, shall I not be accepted? Well, he wasn't accepted because he didn't do well. He didn't bring the proper sacrifice. Well, he brought sacrifice. He didn't bring a sacrifice. He brought the fruit of his hands, the work of his hands. Keep your hand there and look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Again, I'm laying the groundwork for what happened with Babylon here. Hebrews chapter 11. The ancients knew more than we give them credit for. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number 4. There's one verse in the New Testament. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaking. So what Abel did, it still speaks to us today. What did he do? He brought a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did. Why? He brought the lamb, uh, the innocent lamb, not the works of his hands and the fruits of his labors. Uh, and what did he do? He obtained witness that he was righteous. The fact that he brought the proper sacrifice showed that he was trusting God by faith, it says there, and offered unto God by faith, trusting that he was doing the right thing that God told him to do, and the what he obtained witness. That is, God uh, gave witness to the fact that Abel was righteous in his sight because of what happened there. Now, here's, a, here's, a, here's something to think about. Look at uh, Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19 <clears throat> and um, look here at verse number uh, I thought it was Leviticus 19 This is I don't have it my, noted in this Bible here I think it's Deuteronomy I think I think it's Deuteronomy look at Deuteronomy chapter 9 Deuteronomy chapter 9 I believe that's it Deuteronomy chapter 9 Hmm, this is not it. Okay, again, I don't have my regular Bible with the notes in it. But anyway, I'll just, I'll just give you what it says from memory here. What happens is this. Look at Genesis chapter 40. And look here at, um, and if somebody finds the verse, you can let me know. I keep thinking it's 927 something, but I must be wrong, but I think that's what it is. Um, look at Genesis 40 
It says in verse 4, The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. So he takes it to God and he offers that to him. And then Cain comes up and he offers his fruits and vegetables and God doesn't accept it. And he gets mad because God, how did he know? Um, you know what happens in, the, I think, someplace in Numbers, Exodus, or Leviticus, and 927 keeps coming to my mind, that what happens there is that when the sacrifice is offered, a fire comes down from heaven and consumes that sacrifice. Think about in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, 18 there. Remember when Elijah had the contest with the um, false prophets? What did he do? He went down there and he got the wood and everything and then he went down to the river or the creek or wherever and he got buckets of water and he just basically uh, covered that uh, hit the wood and, and, and water, got it soaking wet, and then he was, because the other guys are going to come up there, they're going to, you know, light a fire, this, whatever, and then I wonder how, how are you going to, how are you going to start a fire with wet wood? And so when he goes up there and does that, look at 1 Kings chapter 18, see what happens here. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And, uh, Look at um, verse 25 here. Verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, here's the false prophets, he's challenging, choose you one bullet for yourselves and dress it first. Uh, I mean, still dress it. Uh, and then he says, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullet which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked him and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awake. And the living Bible says he went to the bathroom. Um, anyway, look at verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after this manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. You see that going on in pagan religion today among Catholics, among uh, uh, Muslims, and uh, many other pagan cultures. Um, and it says here, um, verse 20, it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied to the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor answer, any answer, nor any that regarded. So he says, go ahead and build your altar. Put the wood up there, pile it up, but don't put any fire in it. And so they're up there calling on their gods. Now verse 30, Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribe of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of sea. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces. There's the uh, sacrificial animal that's been slain. And laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So he says, Pour it on the sacrificial animal that we just killed. Pour it on the wood. Soak it. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran, ran about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. So he told the false prophets, set your wood up, but don't put any fire in it. Why? Because he's expecting their God to set it on fire if he accepts their offer. He says, I'll build my altar. I'll put my wood up there. But now I want you to just soak it in water so that it can't burn. And then he says this. Verse 36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things of thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart uh, back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. 
So that's how they knew. The fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. So, and then also, I believe, uh, something similar to that happened in uh, Judges chapter 9. Yes? Leviticus 9. Leviticus 9. Is it verse 24? Yep. Oh, okay, I said 27. I was close. I was in the neighborhood. Okay, Leviticus chapter 9. Chapter 9. Okay, chapter 9. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Leviticus 9 and verse number 24. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, verse 24. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. Which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. They knew it was God that was answering that thing. So that's what I was looking for. And, of course, the story about Elijah shows the same thing. So if that's any indication, then the way that they knew back in Genesis 4 was that God must have consumed the sacrifice that Abel offered. But when Abel was waiting for his to be consumed, nothing happened. He's like, okay, you just consumed his, you accepted his, mine's still here, you haven't accepted it, why not? Well, see that he should have known better. He knew he had to bring an animal, sacrifice. And he there were they were available. He could have got one from his brother. But why did he do that? Because he was disobedient to God in this matter. Uh, he wanted to prove his own, I guess, self righteousness. Uh, there's two things I think that keep people from coming to Christ and getting saved. One is their own self-righteousness. The second one is pride. They're too proud to admit that they're a sinner because they're self-righteous in their own minds and hearts. They can't admit that they're a sinner. They can't admit that they got to do it God's way, and God's way is the best way and the only way. Amen. And that's what happens here. So what happens? The religious guy gets mad at the true believer. So mad that eventually, you know what happened? He killed him. He killed him. Why? Because he was mad at his own brother. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Look at this here. 1 John chapter 3. And verse number 11, starting here. Well, I guess we can start verse 10. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. 1 John 3, verse 10. Okay, I'm going to start reading verse 10. This, the children of God, are manifest, or known. And the children of the devil. Here's how you tell the difference. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. The child of God does right, and he loves his brother. That's uh, the outward evidence of a Christian. Look at verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, he was lost, and slew his brother. He killed Abel. In a religious argument. Um, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now, people say this. They'll say, you know, well, no, most all wars are religious wars. That's probably true. But notice in this, what happened to the first religious war was between, one, between two people. Between Cain and Abel, two brothers. One was of the wicked one. That was Cain. He was lost. Self-righteous and proud. And he had Abel, who was humble and obedient and offered the right sacrifices and had faith. He was saved and he was lost. But both of them were religious. Cain was religious. He just was, had the wrong religion. And guess who it was among the religions that started the fight? The one who had the wrong religion. On the other right, really didn't start the fight. He started the consequences, which is a good lesson. And that is, if you study history and it comes to wars between religions, true believers want peace. They don't want war. They want people to get saved. They have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. They don't want to go to battle and kill people and send them to hell because they die without Christ. Um, but you take false religion, uh, false religion has to attack true believers because true believers are the ones that expose them for being false. Amen. So they've got to attack the true believers. And many times those false religious people think they're doing the right thing. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. 
John chapter 16. Look at this here. John chapter 16. And look here. Verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. I don't want you to trip up. I don't want you to uh, get knocked out of the race. I don't want you to be offended here. I don't want you to stumble uh, in your Christian life. Is what he's saying here. And he just told them stuff. And that was that they hated me without a cause. They're going to hate you too. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Look at verse 2. They, that is the religious crowd, the unsaved religious crowd, they shall push you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So those in false religions are going to kill unbelievers, thinking they're doing God's service. But in fact, they're not. Uh, God's people are, are likened to sheep. The false prophets are likened to wolves. Lambs don't kill wolves. Wolves kill sheep. And so we were the sheep. And what did Jesus say? What, what did uh, um, it said about Christ who was brought before uh, Pilate as a lamb to be slaughtered? What did he say in Romans chapter 8? Paul said this. He said we're, we're, we're basically uh, slaughtered every day. That's what he said. Why? Because false religion is going, is out to destroy the truth. And so you talk about religious wars, that's between two people that are, you take the crusade. Religious wars, what was that? That was Catholics thinking that they owned Jerusalem and that was Muslims believing that they owned Jerusalem. And they fought each other and they killed each other. Over. Because the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to you know, plant its flag in there on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. What was that in the Bible? That was Catholics. That was unsaved people vying for property, possessions, and wealth. They weren't trying to win souls to Christ. That was not. There was no Christians among that bunch that went down there to fight the Muslims. Um, and so that was a religious war. Yeah, but there weren't no real Christian. There, no, there was no real, nothing Christian about it. Uh, it was a fake Christianity, of anything. So anyway, uh, Cain and Abel would read there what happened. And what happened was is that they knew the truth and they rejected it. Now, I'll just say this in closing, and we'll look at this next week. We've already looked at it before. And that is in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, there's a religion there that wants to get together without God, without the true God. And then God sees that. God uh, basically breaks that up. Uh, he confounds their languages. They go off in different directions, and they scatter upon the earth. And when they leave Babylon, what do they do? They take the religion of Babylon with them. And so when you study comparative religions throughout the world, why are they all similar? They came from the same source. From where? From mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. That's where it came from. And so all the false religions go back to that. And some of them today, what they do is they... They put on some, some garb of Christianity about them and try to pawn themselves off as being Christian when in that actuality they're false. It's a false Christianity. It's not really not the truth. So anyway, again, we're laying the foundation for Babylon here. I think we just pretty much did that. And that is the truth was there. The truth spread through um, the earliest human beings that God created. But even at the beginning, Abel rebelled against God didn't bring the right sacrifice, the right offering, wound up killing the true believer who brought the right offering. So there were two groups of people, those who were uh, lovers of the truth, those who were rejectors of the truth. Then the flood came, and then after that, they tried to get together at Babylon, and what they do, they did it by expelling God and the truth of God that they knew to create their own religion under Nimrod. And it spread all through the world. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Mystery Babylon, the mother all the false religions. Okay, we'll stop there tonight. We dismiss. Father, heavenly, thank you once again for this day and for your blessings. We pray that you might bless our study of the Word this evening. Pray that it might be helpful, beneficial, encouraging, and help us all to realize, God, that uh, uh, when we have the Bible and believe it, that we do have the truth, we can have faith in it, and Father, we can serve you because the truth that we know is the truth, God, that you've given us, shown us, and proven to us. And we thank you for that. 
Help us, God, to get the truth that others we ask, because the truth will make us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.